Hello and welcome to the seventh episode of Tailoring in Conversation. In this series, I'll be talking to tailors from all around the globe to gain a better insight into their worlds. My guest for today is Joe Holsgrove. Now, you may know Joe as the winner of the 2015 Golden Shears Awards. He started his tailoring career at Denman and Goddard and is now currently working as an undercutter on Savile Row at Deej and Skinner. We're going to talk about apprenticeships, his personal journey and lots of other things. So let's get right into it. Joe, thank you for being here and making the time. Uh, I look forward to our talk. Welcome. It's lovely to join you. So before we get started, there is this question I'd like to ask you. And the question is, who were you at 10 years old? So if me and you were friends and we were 10, uh, how would that be? Blimey. So at 10 years old, I had no, you know, and I don't think at 10 years old, anybody really has any true understanding of what sort of career path they want to, to get into or anything of the sort. Um, I was just, I was somewhat outgoing, obviously, just your, your classic 10 year old really as such you know you have your um interest in sport and creativity but um i would suggest that from a younger age that i, I have always been on the more creative side in terms of enjoying you know arts and crafts and that sort of thing which perhaps in a way has lent itself more towards working with my hands in the future but i you know it's i'm blessed with a, a lovely family who have have been very supportive and you know, understood I, I wanted to, to go into the, the creative arts and, you know, here I am. Did you have any brothers and sisters? Do I have a younger brother, Louis, yeah. He's um has studied fine art at Central St. Martins. So we're um the two of us uh you know, we're we're both sort of very much in the in the creative field, but there's not been a, a long line of people in our family who are sort of creative as it were you know we've we've seemed to have just sort of found ourselves in this position and fortunately seem to be doing quite well with it so so when did you think about going into the artisan lifestyle and to really choose that as your main direction and also um, to go through through it you know with all the hardships and everything it, it brings with it so my actual journey into the trade is quite uh, unusual in the sense that I never actually really ever wanted to be a tailor. I originally wanted to go to art school and uh, study graphic design with the view that what I actually wanted to do is um, work for Apple, but not necessarily really? from, from a product development side of things, but actually from a packaging side of things. Um, I'm sure you'll be familiar when you buy any, any Apple products, even the ergonomics of the box, how it's displayed, even closing the lid and it has that perfect cushion of air. That sort of thing has just been me over a number of years. So I was quite hard set on doing that sort of thing. And um, as a part of my university application to go to art school, etc., I decided that I wanted to do a foundation year, whereby you may or may not know as part of your portfolio to then go on and specialise in further things. With the foundation year, you try everything under this, the creative art umbrella from, you know, lighting production to fashion, fine art, and all of those sorts of things. And then the view being that at the end of that year uh, course, you then pick one as it were and specialize in that. So as I say, as producing my portfolio to go on and do that, I was slightly stuck for something to put under the fashion category because at that point in time, fashion to me, sort of the word fashion you have the sort of preconception of it being very sort of catwalk based and somewhat sort of uh, not necessarily something that you could wear every day for example um so i was slightly stuck for what to do and I, I happened to have a conversation with my granddad granddad george and he um he himself used to work in tailoring so he worked um at kilgow french and stanbury from 1950 through till the 70s, as well, he ended up doing his national service and then coming back to working there. But he worked alongside your Edward Sexton's, Roy Chittleborough's, Joe Morgan's, etc. Um, but one of the he used to work with um, was called Peter Nilsson, who had a business with Ron Shearer, Shearer and Nilsson, 
and they happened to share premises with Demon and Goddard. So I said to Granddad, any way that I could do work experience with whether there may be some connection, any of your old friends may still be working over there, because obviously people live with their craft forever, don't they? Because um, he picked up the phone, spoke to a few people, and I ended up uh, spending some time working with Demon and Goddard, and some other time as a separate work experience working with Edward Sexton. And I can honestly say, at the end of those couple of weeks, I knew that tailoring was for me. I think it's as cliche as it sounds, etc. You know, I, I got to feed on that sort of obsession with things being as specific as you can be and sort of you know mass manifesting your your absolute ideals of things lining up and being just so but it was in a completely different way of producing that you know rather than working in packaging for example where's what i originally thought i was going to the, the medium changes and it's it's cloth you're dressing somebody you're turning their 3d form into back into a 3d form again so yeah completely completely fell into it and um yeah so as i say that that's uh my sort of unusual unusual thing but i, I must honestly say I, I would never look back i honestly couldn't see myself doing anything else at all well i guess you you can kind of like compare it with packaging because you know eventually it is to do with presentation well you're presenting you know if you have a product you need to present it in its best way so for want of better words it's the most appealing to the consumer but from a personal perspective, you're creating a first impression, aren't you? Or a lasting impression. In our case, we produce things that are so, so finite in, in our quality and, and the, the, the end product that the people wear. So that not only is it comfortable, but, you know, it, it really does look the part as well. So I suppose, yeah, in a way, I've never really thought of looking at it like that. But you are completely right. It is. Did you did you have any ideas about how the lifestyle of a tailor was i mean obviously your granddad george would tell you but um did you have any some sort of an idea of the days you would be making and and how the how your upcoming years would look like basically yeah i mean if i'm completely honest no i mean uh, as i said I, I completely stumbled into it i've i've been very very lucky that opportunities have, have arisen whereby i've you know I, I spent my time doing my work experience and then was was you know lucky that i was then contacted somewhat uh, afterwards as in the middle of my a-level exams actually they said look you know i understand you're studying hard to get your a-levels and go off to university but we'd like to give you the opportunity this is a at demon and goddard um to work alongside a, a fantastic coat maker called dino and um the opportunity was too good to miss so i was obviously very mindful that these sort of things don't happen every day um so yeah as i say i i would never have really even thought about the lifestyle and, and you know what goes with it because I truly had absolutely nothing like no insight other than until I first got there you know it's obviously nice to hear granddad's stories and his lifelong dear friends that he's had from from his time in but you know it's, it's almost gone full circle now because now here I am giving my experience and quite often it's the same stories but just a number of decades later so that's nice but as I say I would, I would never have had any idea so t t tell us a little bit more about your apprenticeship, because obviously you have in your mind this uh, doing something more academic, you know, with to do with design and, and things like that. But now you're going into this place where everything is like, you know, one on one. You have a master and apprentice relationship. How did you experience that? So I th understandably, there are always times when you're in quite in, in the more traditional uh, Savile Row tailing side of things, you know, you're in these basements that were, I mean, more recently that they have, well, as you know yourself, have got a lot sort of more modernised in as such. But you know, the we learned in was was rather small, and um, you know, it, it did become rather hot at times in there. And you are in very close quarters with your master. I mean, you are their apprentice, and what they say goes, right? And I mean, understandably, there are times when things became slightly heated because you know you're being told what to do and you know they're expecting you to to be able to achieve this absolute standard that they've strived to uphold for their entire career and um you know there were times when it was very very tough as, as you know i mean again when you're an apprentice it's not the most uh financially rewarding time but you know you have to think that you're investing in your you know when you you finish your, your, your time and we used to start at eight o'clock in the morning 
you know, you do your day's work and then by the end of the day you think, no, I am going to stay on and, and do another couple of hours, whether it be practicing. I mean, initially, as you know, you spend weeks and months learning padding stitches to get your hand in. And I was particularly rare case. I'd literally never, ever sewn properly before. So, you know, for the first few weeks, Dino and Ty, um, tie my thing, finger back on my with my thimble using a piece of selvage to hold my middle finger in that exact place so that I couldn't I couldn't not use the thimble and, and sort of gauge intention with your little finger. Um, and there were times over the first few months and even in the first year, you think, God, like, I've been doing this same thing. Like, surely I must be able to move on. And, you know, without realising it, you're actually getting your, your eye in and your hand into achieving that that sort of level of detail that you, that you don't realise is being ingrained into you, whereby when you then move on to the next stage, you take that sort of pre-existing hand sewing with you so then, you know, as you develop and you learn your pockets and then you start making up the, the various panels of the garment, when you learn it in stages, it's only then you get X amount of years down the line and you think, blimey, it's just putting those pieces. There's lots of skill involved in every stage, but, you know, there, there are times when you, you're sort of challenging yourself, thinking, goodness, like, how much longer is this going to take? Because it does, as you know, to learn it properly, it does take a lot of time. And then, um, you know, you just have to keep thinking to yourself, this really is this is absolutely worth it. Like it's going to be worth it one day and all like to keep telling yourself that. But then I think it only really truly sort of shows itself and you can sort of be proud when you ultimately, when you make yourself a jacket, I remember I made myself a blazer and to wear it and know that I have made, I, I've made it from start to finish. It's so rewarding. And that then gives you the urge to no, I want to, I want to start another one. I'm going to, this or this bit could be better. They know what you think of this, you know, you keep going over and over and over that that sort of obsession to try and be as good as you can be. But I think you just have to keep reminding yourself that, you know, it's going to be worth it one day. I mean, even now we're investing time into the cutting side of things. You have to just sort of persevere and think, you know, we're, we're going to get there type of thing, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, this is this is a very interesting part. I think we can go into this a little bit more. So, you know, you talk about being... Um, you know, alongside the master, they have a certain standard. You have to achieve that standard. You have fairly little to say, and uh, you're also in the beginning stages. So, for for maybe some of the people who are out there thinking of going into tailoring or whatsoever, I think we can have this conversation about when you're just starting out and you do, you don't have a lot of knowledge and experience, and you're tied up pretty much to one person who's going to tell you this is what you need to do in order to get there. How can you, as a newcomer, develop that relationship and the trust, um, especially if you're very passionate and you just want to progress and you want to do the next thing and the next thing? How can you develop that trust in the first place to be able to take it slow, repeat and repeat and repeat and not think, hey, someone is holding me back or what, you know, what, what are they up to, basically, and, and, and still continue motivated um, to do the things that you're doing? I think with, you know, as, as I said, when you start out, that you, you are keep, you think to yourself, blimey, like, oh, I have been doing this for a long time. You, you do keep telling yourself, you know, it is, as I said, it's going to be worth it, etc. But, you know, that that person, I mean, from my own experience, Dino, and, and we've had, I mean, because we're lifelong friends now, I and mean, obviously we have since parted ways since I changed companies, but he has, um, we, we still keep in touch. We have that inseparable bond. But, you know, we've had this conversation that, and, and exactly as you said, he, that sometimes, I mean, he even suggested there may have been times where I might have felt that he was holding me back. But he said that mm -hmm. he wanted me to be the, the best that I could be and teach me everything that he knew himself. So, you know, he mm -hmm. said in times where, you know, you might have felt that you're doing something perhaps longer than you could have progressed, but he wanted to make sure that I was absolutely, you know, it was completely ingrained in me that something should be to a certain standard. And if mm -hmm. he didn't feel quite ready for it, you know, he said he wanted me to be a carbon copy of himself. So if he let me go on before I was quite ready, and I then accepted that as my, well, that's passable, that's my standard. Well, if I ever fell just short of that standard, straight away that's two levels lower than where his standard was do you, do you see what i mean yes yeah absolutely heart set on me being absolutely as you know as, as good as can be 
and then you know as time progressed and you know as i'm sure you're aware yourself when you work alongside somebody in such a close relationship as your apprenticeship progresses you end up making more and more parts of the garment or you'll end up making up rather than making up you know putting your cuts in your canvases and attaching your side body and then doing the canvas separate nice thing you then start canvassing the four parts putting the pockets in making up the facings but then and then for example would then show fronts put the facings on attach body linings all that sort of thing and then you end up becoming this sort of i don't want to say double act it's like a, like a partnership isn't it it becomes like a, a really key yeah. work I mean, it's not a production line by any means because of the nature of the work but it's you know you're really in sync yeah so i think you know to say to somebody you know who's, who's just setting out and, and they feel that there is such a, a mountain to climb with it you know i would absolutely recommend just for goodness sake just persevere with it because you know you, you have to strive to the very best you can and also it, it helps quite often if you are in a position where you can break down the different parts of the garment so padding for example you spend amount of time you would be padding and making up under collars and, and body canvases etc but then when you get you're allowed to start making in breast pockets was my next step so so you do your in breast pockets and then you know with that you're learning the machine skill and you know controlling and, and straightness of machining etc um i mean initially you learned how to do them by hand in the real like the, the true old 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 mm. school lovely skill to be able to uphold and then you have the option of using both mm. but you know if you break that down into your individual steps and then focus on a particular thing you know after hours or if you're at home you're lucky to have the, the ability to be able to practice indoors we're in a, a small area i mean you don't need much to be able to practice making a pocket you know use those yeah. skills keep working and striving to do them as best as you possibly can you know start with a plain material then maybe you know when you're mm -hmm. confident be spot on then look at maybe using a stripe material because then you're using the pre-existing skill but now whilst you do still concentrate on the standard of the other bits, you're now looking at lining up stripes, for example, once you've got the hang of that, yeah. then doing a check, you know, break it down into individual processes. And then if you get each process, mm -hmm. each stage of the garment up to a, a sort of a, a definitive standard, then you can then look at incorporating mm -hmm. parts of the garment. And it really is a, a sequence. As you know, you, you make different parts to go on to the yeah. next garment, don't you? So I'll yeah, just, yeah to say just persevere with it and really try and break it down and, and almost simplify it really rather than it just being making a jacket look at the individual processes as part of that yeah yeah but did you uh did you do um so of officially was your apprenticeship a, a being an, a coat making apprentice or a trouser making or cutting or was it a combination of all um when i was at denman and goddard i was a coat making apprentice so, mm -hmm. you know, we made everything from, you know, your, your tail coats, overcoats, which basically specializing in anything with sleeves from, you know, we made everything from mm -hmm. shoot your normal sort of your blazer in sports jacks, the, everything under that umbrella. But of course you can then apply, yeah. with, I mean, lucky that within the basement and another thread, uh, friends and people that are in the trade, you can pick up little tips and sort of ask questions to various people. And, you know, if I wanted a suit, I'd have a go at making a suit had the pre-existing yeah. sort of, of handling of the materials and applying such skill to create a jacket well looking at the similarities between coat making and waistcoat making for example you can sort of in your mind a certain understanding of such garments you can then you know not it's not you can just look at something and put it together but you're you're, you're trained to be able to understand garment construction aren't you so as that progressed mm -hmm. if i wanted a suit for example I'd get some cloth and I have a go at making it. The people who I was surrounded by would obviously be mindful that I'm their apprentice. So they wanted me to be representing not only myself, but themselves in the best light. So I was very fortunate that people were very generous in their knowledge and in telling me how to do it. So as I say, yeah, I did, whilst it was specializing in coat making, I have uh, acquired the, the skill to be able to do waistcoats and trousers, etc., along the way. So. And that was then and then now at Dijon Skinner I'm I'm an undercutter. So sort of continuing my, my knowledge further to, you know, be a, a master tailor basically. Yes, yes. If if you would say so if you would have to do your apprenticeship all over again with the perspective that you have and the experiences experiences that you have now, 
what would you say you may have done differently or you would done have more of or, 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 or things like that? How, how would you look at that now? Um, I think with my insight that I have now, I mean, as I said, when I first started as an apprentice, I was only basing that mm -hmm. sort of trade on, I mean, what the basically a month's work experience split between Dem and the Goddard and Edward Sexton. So two varying houses with very unique styles. Um, mm -hmm. I think to sort of compare my knowledge now to how I was there, it's obviously quite difficult because obviously I've got such a more of an understanding. But I would suggest that, you know, if, you know, and, and even continuing through my career and, and to anybody, and, and as I'm sure you understand yourself and would welcome this sort of suggestion that if somebody's prepared to give up their time to show you something, you know, the way that I've been shown how to sew, for example, it works for me. I know I like it. I trust it. I know that the, the quality is absolutely there and it's been handed down from generation to generation. If somebody else shows me a way of doing something and I find that that might be, you know, a, a, of use for me, you know, listen to somebody. If somebody's prepared to show you something and show you how they do it, mm -hmm. why not know two ways of doing something? Why, why just be mm -hmm. complete? I mean, I am quite heart set on the way that I, I make things but it might only be one tiny little tip that, that I might get and it completely change ways because I'm absolutely, as I say, I'm, I'm quite sort of set on, on being comfortable in how I make, but you know, one, one small mm -hmm. thing pick up from somebody, absolutely take it on board because, you know, what, why would you deny yourself of that extra knowledge? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Why do you think that a lot of, because obviously this is a thing, it's like most of the tailors that I know and I've spoken to, um, you know they have their system they they produce in according to the system they fine tune the system once in a while they review it or like you say someone comes along they show them something and they take that on board but in general why do you think that most tailors when they do develop a system because uh, this is this is for, for for those who don't know and are listening to this you know having a system is a thing you, you need to have one because otherwise you know you you can't produce or you can't be efficient but why do you think that so many tailors are um very particular about their system and are less flexible when it comes down to changing like suddenly the way they put on their colors or suddenly the way they make their canvases when they learn something most of the time maybe like 80 percent 90 percent of the time they tend to just keep that and maybe fine tune it a little bit rather than changing it completely. Why do you think that is? It's funny. I, I often think, so I think when, when you very, very first start out, let's say, I mean, people will enter our trade in, in lots of different experience levels, don't they? So obviously some people have a pre-existing understanding and, and can sew to quite a high standard. Other people, such as myself, got absolutely no idea. But I think not only from my own uh, perspective, but also other people who have sort of gone through the mill as it were you know if you are learning from somebody and when you first start out let's just say you're uh, at a, a point where you you have no understanding for example mm -hmm. if somebody turns around and says don't do it like that that's wrong this is how you do it from day one in the trade you're learning that method aren't you and you always try yeah. when you're working alongside somebody if you're working alongside somebody and producing um, and working on the garments which ultimately have their name against them because you're only really helping them as part of your apprenticeship, aren't you really, when they're, they're actually making it, you need to be working to their standard and their way of doing things. And I think when people learn that and you finally finish your apprenticeship and in, in more traditional times you, you, you finish your apprenticeship and then you then go ahead and you, you're working for yourself on the board, say, and you know, if you've just learned something and you know that that system works and you know this from, from a making perspective, you know that this system works and you know that the quality is absolutely there, fundamentally you shouldn't necessarily need to have to change it because you know it works. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, if, if somebody turns around and says to you, oh, I do mine like this, you shouldn't necessarily dismiss what they're suggesting, but exactly mm -hmm. said, maybe use that key information to refine perhaps what you've done or, or sort of cherry pick what this oh I quite like that I might have a go at that sort of thing but I think from for, for generations and generations if somebody turns around and says don't do it like that you know this is how you do it you're then learning that way aren't you 
So yeah, sort of stay with that way. Perhaps whether or not it's because it's a safe, you know, you, you know it works and that's your tried and tested method. Um, but it, it is, as you say, I mean, people are very guarded, but by, by what they do. But I also think that people are sort of quite protective and, and rather guarded about what their, their way of doing things because they've invested so much time to get to that point. Mm-hmm. They're almost, I don't want to say that they feel threatened by change, but, you know, they're, mm-hmm. I don't want to say possessive either. I, I don't quite know the word I'm looking for, but could you understand where I'm coming from? They're mm-hmm. quite, you know. Yes. Embrace other people's suggestions. You never really, well, mm-hmm. you shouldn't really, if it really does, is to a good enough standard, you shouldn't really need to sway from your, your trusted method. But, mm-hmm. you know, it's, mm-hmm. I think it depends on the individual, really, how open to interpretation you are with taking on board other people's comments really i don't know how do you feel about yes. that um well i i think pretty much what most of what you say i i i completely agree with i i would add to that maybe that um perhaps it's you know because most coat makers specifically or trouser makers just most makers um yeah. they are limited with the time they have because they you know they get paid by piece and it seems that all the years they've gone through learning things, they've created this some sort of a map of how things should be because they test out, well, it's this efficient, it takes this much time, it t- this many trimmings that I need for this. And then as soon as that disrupts by a change of technique, they have to reorder that m- entire map some- somehow. No, absolutely. I mean, as I said, when I sort of in answering your question, really I was sort of concentrating that on a more... Um, from from a, a making perspective really as a not sort of yes rest so far with with the cutting side of things but okay if i were to sort of observe it and sort of answer maybe from a, a, an insight into the cutting side of things there are lots of different systems and ways of doing things but mm-hmm. again even with the making side or, or for both you know you, you're often told mm-hmm. this is how i'm going to show you but you'll find exactly mm-hmm. as you're saying you'll find your own way of doing things you know as you're saying with regards to being mm-hmm. you know from the making perspective you're paid per piece you know you, you find the way that's quickest for you and that you like doing things and then you ultimately take on board as your career progresses you take on board all of these sort of key pieces of information and then you have mm-hmm. your way of doing it which then your apprentice will then interpret learn stay along but they may get to a point where they've then taken on board lots of other influence and they then have their yeah i think it's i think it's it is an interesting sort of sort of way of looking at things mm-hmm. but i think fundamentally people are just quite um exactly as you're saying they're they're sort of guarded as to, to stick with what they're doing because they know that that best works for them and any sort of mm-hmm. interrupt or some kind of uh disorientation mm-hmm. with what's what's going on in their time scale true would you say uh and i think this is kind of like a um a, how would you say I think everyone would probably have a different answer for this. I'm curious as, as to see what you think. Would you say it's better to know one technique and repeat that a million times or to know a million techniques that you've repeated once? I, blimey, I think in order to, um, now how can I best answer that? If that's okay? I think that if you are to have a particular way of doing something and mm-hmm. it's from the beginning you know you've got to practice doing something and repetition is key really with understanding you know how you do things mm-hmm. taking method and repeating 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 the changing factors which then come into that you apply that method to are you know mm-hmm. you're looking at the materials the you know mm-hmm. the pattern or, or ultimately down to the thickness how different things handle whether they mark with chalk efficiently you know you've got to take into the consideration all of these different factors i personally would say that it's better to have one method or, or one technique as you said it that's absolutely tried and tested but you you apply that with your, your very very best skill to lots of different mm-hmm. variants then try lots of things in all different ways and you know my, my key focus mm-hmm. is creating something to the highest standard that it could possibly be and i would personally rather mm-hmm. learn a way of doing something can do that to the very best of my ability than not to say that other people's sort of the, the methods or, or influences as you say might might produce a different result but if i know that something works for me and it produces something to a high standard i would much rather stay with that to uphold that 
that standard personally yeah yes I, I I agree I think you know one of the funny things about what we do is that quality actually comes after you've well you've reached a certain level of quantity of, of repeating and repeating and repeating um, how 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 do you find I, I I also want to talk about the golden shares and because uh, you've been the winner of golden shares was it 2015 16 and yes yeah 2015. Yeah, yeah, and, and so so before before we we just go into that, um, do you think that because obviously you know you can do an apprenticeship and you also can go to a tailoring course or maybe a tailoring school, what what would you say are uh, as far as as you as you know what would you say are the fundamental differences of of maybe mastering how to make a jacket in a school versus mastering how to make a jacket in a workshop? Um, I think. When you're, well, I, having never actually been down the more, um, I don't, it's the word education like that, that sort of higher education side of thing, because I went straight into an apprenticeship since leaving school. So I wouldn't wish to sort of comment too deeply on how I sort of think differences are, because I've never done one side of it. But observationally, when we have people come in um, quite frequently to, to ask for advice for things, you know, getting into the trade, they're currently studying at your LCFs, etc. Um you know, we, we often suggest to people that come in is that the way that you, you would learn in that um, in, in the school environment, you have the certain deadlines to meet as part of the course. So they say, oh, well, what year I've done and I've done facings and I've done this and I've done that. But the, the key thing which we look for and, and I would advise to people is, you know, I, we completely understand that you're set out with your path of, you know, you've got to go through this part of the course and then this week we might completely change and move on to the next thing because it's concentrated into a certain time frame isn't it um the the main difference i would suggest between that and and actually learning alongside an individual apart from being part of a class you obviously as an apprentice to somebody you have their undivided attention but that individual if they don't feel that you're ready to then move on to the next step, there's no, I mean, traditionally an apprenticeship would be five to seven years for coat making, for example. You know, if if you get to a certain stage and you're ready to move on, then you move on. But if it takes slightly longer, you're, you know, you're, the expression or you're, you're held back, you're not really held back because whilst in a, from a time perspective, oh, it's getting closer to the end of the five years and I'm still not on to centre. But if the person who's teaching you is truly teaching you to that highest standard to uphold, they won't let you move on until you've absolutely mastered that step because you're then ready to move on to the next one. So that by the end of it, if you've learned each and every process as part of the garment to the highest standard, there's no reason that the finished garment shouldn't be to that, that standard. Do you see what I mean? So that's my sort of observational understanding of the difference between both is that, you know, perhaps I wouldn't wish to speculate, but perhaps at, by the end of certain courses, because um, we, we do often have people who come in and say, oh, I'm, do you, I would like to enter a, a, a career in, in coat making, for example, have you got mm -hmm. any work? And we say, well, can we see some work? So oh, well, I haven't gone through it, but I have just finished a, such and such a course. And I just hope that when people are on such course that they're encouraged to, to do things, but do also, you know, meet the standard. Because as several rotates, we have quite a reputation to uphold. So it's just making sure that the opportunities are there for people to perhaps just refine a few key things and, and make sure that we, we continue to make the best things that we possibly can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I was... Uh... I was speaking to Claire, Claire Emerson, and one of the very interesting things that she said was that it was very beneficial for her during her apprenticeship years when there were new apprentices who could take over the things that she had already learned so that she could progress. I don't know how many apprentices there were at Demon and Goddard. Were you the only or one of the few? Apprentice there. So... I, as I said, I worked alongside Dino and we had our own small room. Um, so I, again, I, I couldn't necessarily give, give an insight into that side of thing because I was literally the only apprentice. So it was um, a somewhat unique, unique path, through say, whereby mm -hmm. I was just an individual and, and that was it. There wasn't any other 
sort of influence from how somebody on the board next to me of my age was getting on with their master or where are you up to oh yeah he's let me do today type thing I, I didn't have that interaction with other people and to be honest it was only really as I progressed through my apprenticeship and spent longer in the trade that I then sort of became friends with other individuals in the trade because obviously when you're in that sort of apprenticeship and, and you're you're in, in the basement for example your, your time there is is for work isn't it so it's only as time goes on and you know a bit more and you can you know venture out at lunchtime and see the outside world sort of mm. thing meet other people within the trade and, and do build lifelong friendships so yeah would you you wouldn't say that being the only apprentice it, it, it wasn't restricting for you in any way would you i no i, I no i don't think so i mean as i said to from the sort of beginning that you know I having had no insight into the trade at all I didn't really know how it should have gone because I never had the other somebody else there to say oh well I was up to that by now or you should be doing this by now because I didn't know but I don't feel that it's limited me or, or inhibited my learning in, in any way whatsoever if anything I'd suggest that it was a positive because you know I, I got that undivided attention but I, I can actually proudly say that I, I was Dino's only ever apprentice in his whole career so he's been doing it for 60 years now and really he's passed on his life's work and his life's knowledge to me which i think is such a wonderful a beautiful gift for him to have given me um but yeah I, if anything i would only ever see it as a positive to be honest with you yes i think per, per, well perhaps this explains also partially why taylor's value the things they've learned so much because it is actually someone's lifetime work that they are given kind of and they had to work hard for it and now maybe one day you know we can we can uh, pass down our kind of like knowledge okay um golden shears um you know tell us a little bit about that how, how did that start why did you think that you should do the golden shears um and how was the process around that and obviously tell us how it was to win uh um because it it, it 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 definitely is an achievement which which should be acknowledged and i think it encourages many people to just learn uh, a lot more so that they can partake so yeah uh, well thank you first of all it's um yeah i mean it's a number of years ago now so it's a <laughs> trip down memory lane but we um you know, as a company, it was always, I mean, I, as I was their only apprentice and I was the only apprentice that had worked there for, well, for, for years and years, if not a decade. So it was quite nice that as the, they were sort of nearing the end of their careers, well, says they're still working, obviously, but it was things that were sort of gradually winding down to a certain extent that, you know, it was like one last hurrah, if you like, to get somebody to, to enter and go through and, and, and achieve that, that sort of that title, as it were. So, you know, it was always spoken about and it was i just think it's nice exactly as you've said not only for individuals who are apprentices within the trade but from outside of the trade as well it's such a lovely thing to be able to focus on and you know strive to achieve you know you've, you've got to it is judged on your pattern construction your garment construction the designs how everything all relates together both technically and aesthetically and you know it's it's such a a good way of sort of focusing your energies and and you know it makes it worth staying up all night practicing a certain thing because then when you do it on the your your shears entry it needs to be as good as it could possibly be um it's a nice a nice way of you know it's particularly if you do it towards the end of your apprenticeship as as i did it was a nice for me a nice end to my apprenticeship because it made all of that time as i said spending weeks and months doing the same thing it makes it all worthwhile, you know, without sounding too, too cliche on it. But yeah, you know, it was, it's really good. I mean, when you, you enter that there is obviously the apprehension, have I done something creative enough and, and all that sort of thing. But it was nice. I mean, my entry really, I, in my own personal character, I wouldn't say that I was particularly um, adventurous with my dress sense as it were. I mean, I, I have all you can see behind me. I've got a pink check suit now, for example, but you know, I've, I'm quite sort of traditional in, in my aesthetic and for me I wanted to to produce something which was you know whilst it was still striking on the catwalk and had that sort of difference about it I could actually incorporate the technical skill that I'd spent so long learning into those garments so I had a, mine had um 
you know, your patch pockets with flaps that was in a, a check material, so it made that slightly more um, skill shown. But, you know, I had a shooting pleats in the back, but inside the back, inside the actual pleats itself was a contrast material um, with the, the half belt on the back, but it was matched on the bias going across and that sort of thing. I wanted to produce something that I felt best reflected my ability in, in creating the, the garments because I was concerned that if I were to try and achieve something which was, um, you know, slightly more catwalk, for example, that I might have then, you know, not, not necessarily struggled, but, you know, as, at that point, you're still it's come towards the end of your apprenticeship, but you are still an apprentice. I wanted to absolutely show off everything that I'd learned rather than trying to push myself too far. And I think that it, well, it did pay off in the end, but, um, you know, I, with my garments that they were just made to the absolute very best of my ability. So mm -hmm. I'm just very cool that that was reflected in the, uh, and recognized in, in the scoring, shall you say? So, yes, yeah, yes. It, were, when, when you were making the, the garment, uh, were you more focused well, how, well, it's it's because you just you did mention that you wanted to show every skill that you had acquired by by that time. But obviously, there are two parts with, with the golden shoes. You know, one is the technical side that gets judged, and then you have the catwalk. How much did you think about the catwalk uh, versus just purely technical display of skill? I mean, when I say oh, I, I didn't want to do something too catwalk, I mean obviously it has to be striking and have that eye catching appeal to it. I mean, as you, you will have seen in the actual garments, I mean, it was a, um, a half shooting jacket in a, in a tan color with a, a blue facing with matching the, the check that was in the, the blue facings was matching the, the tan color of the jacket um, with the then I had a blue check trouser. But I wanted to rely on the, the, the striking element. You know, I, th I thought that the, the cloth should, should speak for itself. And, you know, rather than trying too hard to try and be eye catching and, and try and incorporate lots of crazy pocket designs and like really yeah. going wild with all the optional extras, should we say, I felt that it should be more sort of refined and if anything, effortlessly eye catching because it's striking enough and the quality of, of its very make, if you like, and, and yeah. fit, et cetera, that is then what lent itself to standing out because I mean, it took a long time to get to it, so I feel like it's ever, you know, the, the work spoke for itself. I didn't feel that I needed to be too, perhaps that sounds arrogant, I don't wish to, but, you know, I, I wanted it to be striking, but not sort of overpowering, hence the material choices and, and what I chose to do. I'm just very grateful that that was recognised and, uh, yeah, here I am all these lazy talking about it. Was it a surprise to, when you won or did you expect to win when you got close and you were in the finals? And It suggests that I ever expected to win. I think that that, that would suggest a sense of arrogance, but I, I would suggest that I was very confident in my ability that, you know, when I've you know got, got through to the final as such, I, I was obviously very proud to even make it to the final. It is a huge achievement, but I I wouldn't suggest that I ever expected to win, but I knew that... I had put the work in, not just to create in those garments, but right up until that point throughout my whole apprenticeship that when I created those garments, I was confident in their craft because I knew how hard I'd worked to get to that point and then on those particular garments. So I think, yeah, the best way to answer that would politely just be to say that I had absolute confidence in my ability. It was then obviously down to the competition and to the, to the technical judging side of things. So. Yes, yes. No, I, I, I can completely imagine how that would be. Um, what would you say were some of the toughest moments for you, both both in your apprenticeship and after your apprenticeship or during any tailoring related project that you were doing? Uh, any moments that you just thought, you know, I, I either I'm going to quit or I'm just going to take like a year of holiday uh, or or I'm just going to. Uh, smash this ham into pieces or you know just the most frustrating one. Oh gosh i think that sort of expression of uh of anger towards our trade it, it tends to happen really more towards the beginning of, of one's apprenticeship because it feels like you know there are times when you've you've absolutely strived to be the the, the very best that it possibly can be 
and then you hand it over to your, your master who then turns around and says uh, unfortunately you're gonna have to start that again and you know there's only so many times that one can can spend hours making something and be told that it's not good enough but then you know it was never meant maliciously or, or anything of the sort of you know that that sort of thing I think if anything is only good for somebody because you know you, as I said from the, the whole way through we, we strive to do what we do as as several road tailors and, and working at the, the level that we do across the industry you know it only survives and the reputation only survives by people investing time and knowledge and, and sharing knowledge and that sort of thing to strive to be the very best that we can be so you know that that sort of anger and suggested uh, wish to to leave the trade i think really only happened for me in the first couple of years of my apprenticeship you know don't get me wrong there are times when you're doing something and you know everybody has bad days but if you look back and you know what we're creating is beautiful garments but you know we're not saving lives you have to kind of put it into perspective it is just a piece of material that's ultimately it's going to look nice but you know you have to take a step back at times and think you know go on you're not going to be defeated by a piece of cloth here but you know let's <laughs> Let's put it into perspective, you know. So, but yeah, I think it's really more towards the beginning of, of my experience in the trade that I felt such a such feeling. Yes, it, it, well, it's it's you could say probably it's, it's also like a maturing process because you know, it, it, like you say in the beginning, you're in this constant battle of like, why is this piece of material not doing what I wanted to do? Oh, don't and. How would you how would you say your your perspective in what ways has your perspective changed from the from the moments that you started not only in in terms of making and and, and just skills or technical skills but also just um, social skills and the community of tailoring because obviously when you just start out you like you say uh, you're just working you don't go out for lunchtime all you're doing is just padding lapels padding canvases but now that you've spoken so many people you've done so many. How, in what ways has your perspective grown, let's say, if not changed? Grown is definitely the, the definitely the way of putting it. I mean, you you have your understanding of of, of the trade, and and really, I think the main thing that's changed for me, apart from acquiring the skill, the main thing that's changed for me over the last few years is gradually knowing more and more people in the trade, and you know, making true lifelong friends. I think as you. Mm -hmm. You know, you work so closely with people and, and our industry and, and, and the trade itself is actually really rather small, as you know, from the various charity functions, etc., that happen throughout the year, or normally, um, you know, you, you can get 90% of our trade in one hall. And, you know, it's, I think the nice thing for, as you progress through the trade and, and then you do meet other apprentices who are in the same position as you or of a similar age and, you know, people are all, have, I mean, we've all ultimately got the best shared same interest, haven't we? So it's nice that, you know, as, as I've sort of progressed through the trade, I think the main thing that's changed for me is just enjoying it. You know, you have to love what we do because of the, the obsessive detail that goes into creating the garments. But to be able to do that, I mean, we, we were even just talking the other day, some, some friends of mine and colleagues of mine who, I mean, we feel very proud that we can go to work and be proud of what we do and dress a certain way and, you know, uphold that skill and, and tradition to an extent. But also we get to wear garments that we created ourselves, which are the sort of combination of, of X amount of years work. But we do also get to work alongside our dear friends, you know. So I think that's one of the nice from my own perspective that's happened as I've progressed through the trade is is. You know, it seems to just every week it, it seems to be getting better and better from it's not not to suggest that it is just massively social. But, you you know, from just the experience, our trade is is a, a very, very social trade. So, you know, it's nice to be able to, you know, everybody works hard, but the benefits are there with how you progress through your career, but also what goes with it. So, what, yeah, that, what would you do if. Um if tailoring became completely wiped out and irrelevant, let's say in, in five or 10 years, what, what, what would you do? Cause you have, cause you've spent like X amount of time building all these skills. Uh, I think I, I was thinking, well, not that I think about it often, but you know, sometimes your mind wanders when you're on the train, etc. I think 
Well, there, there's two options, both completely different. I think I'd either like to go into, you know, either the classic car restoration or sort of coach building as I think, again, that sort of really unique application of, of, of working with your hands, basically, and being able to stand back and look at something and, and flowing lines and all that sort of thing. You know, there are lots of crossovers between tailoring and coach building, really, because it is, you know, it applies the same sort of skill set, obviously, with very, very different materials. Um, but, you know, yeah, something something along those lines would be one of them. And then, to be honest with you, I think the second one would be I'd probably like quite tough to go into the army. Just a, a complete, yeah, curveball there. But, um, yeah, I've, it's just something that's always, particularly with, like, the grandfathers that have, have served and great-grandfathers, etc. I just think, you know, why not? Yeah. Plus, you get to win. Ultimately, you get to look the part, don't you? So, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, work. yeah. Well, would you say it's maybe? Uh, well, both. Well, both of your answers, I, I, I find deeply interesting. You know, the, the, the first one is more craft related, uh, which is really to do with the technical side and, and all the things that you have. But the other, the, the going into the army, um, again, there, there, it's not really a, the technical side of tailoring. But maybe would you say it's more the repetition, discipline, community, things like that. Absolutely, yeah. Sense of togetherness, I think, would be the, the best thing to suggest mm -hmm. on that. Um, but that's not to say that they're the only two things. I mean, the, the mind often wonders that there's all sorts of things that we could apply skill to. Um, that just happened to be two things that at present would be of interest. You know, it might be another year down the line that might be completely different. It's just happens to be those at, at present. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. I, I, I sometimes think about because you know, obviously, uh, being in the army, it's is is what well, first of all, it's it's a big responsibility, and but it's also uh, uh, something big you do for your community and your country as well. It's a big service, really, and uh, I sometimes think about you know tailoring, and I and I wonder, you know, ta I I don't I hate to say it like that because uh, I don't want to devalue it, and 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 by no means do I think it it is de devalued if I do say it, but. Sometimes I think, well, you know, tailoring, the tailoring that we do is a very luxurious, it's a, it's a luxury thing, you know. No one needs what we make, pre pretty much apart from the time that you have everything you need, now you also want, want to present yourself well. But sometimes I think if tailoring would have an element that would make it irreplaceable, more important than it is today, I sometimes do think, what would that element be, you know? What would be the thing that would just bring tailoring one level higher than it is and more necessary. Do you have any thoughts on that? Have you ever th thought about that? You know, that that's entirely down to how the, the general population dress, isn't it, really? I mean, th there is obviously, well, every year there's a, the ever-increasing demand for, for fast fashion and that side of things. But I think in, in more recent times, people have been a lot more respectful of people's craft and you know, small business to a certain extent that people are prepared to spend a little more. So, I mean, obviously with bespoke tailoring, it, it often carries quite a, a high price, but that's only reflective of the amount of work that goes into such garments. But I think, you know, when you look back about 40, 50 years, every town would have their local tailor. It's only in the last few years that people often say, oh, you're a tailor, go in that dying trade. Well, locally, yes. Internationally, no. But I think that if... You know, until the social trend changes and people, you know, dress differently. I mean, the, the last year has been a, 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 almost <laughs> a, a knife wound to, to the tailoring industry that, you know, it's it's not until social trends change and people do strive to dress differently, as you say. You know, people dress a certain way for weddings, if they're going to races, that sort of thing. People enjoy wearing suits, but you look at the city, for example, a number of my friends work in in the city and you know their dress codes have been broken down that they only have to wear a chino with an open collared shirt on a friday you might wear a jean in there you know so that sort of thing is you know that that's the sort of thing that you're constantly up against whilst it's lovely that the world is becoming ever more relaxed and embracing of, of all different walks of life and everything completely you know if from a tailoring perspective 
that doesn't necessarily lend itself well if dress codes are changing to the selling of, of a suit, for example. But even ourselves, we've noticed that, you know, whilst we do make uniforms and, and very, very, well, some of the like, very, very high profile uniforms and, and garments seen the world over, you know, we've noticed that from a more um, regular business side of things, people aren't necessarily buying your chalk stripe flannel suits, for example. A lot of more people are thinking, well, I'll get a suit. It can be a classic navy suit, you know, whatever. But you can wear things. You know, people are going for checks and, and that sort of things, but largely buying things that they can wear separately as a sports jacket mm-hmm. or a separate pair of trousers to wear a jean and that sort of things. You know, I think we, we've just as tailoring has to grow and adapt to be, well, ultimately to remain relevant. Because I think after, you know, there's only so long that you can be stuck in the the old way. And whilst I do think it's still important to uphold traditions and values of what we do, you can't just be regimented and stuck in this sort of almost Dickensian mindset of, you know, you you can't do that and it has to be done this way. If somebody wishes to dress a certain way and express themselves a certain way, then absolutely all for it. Mm -hmm. What sort of trends, uh, well, uh, it's not trends really. Um, Is it trends? I don't know. Um, what what sort of uh, steps, let's say, can tailors, not just companies, because obviously we've had like we have like lots of uh, independent tailors as well. Right. They're just a one man band. They have like 10 clients and they just work with that. What sort of steps do you think both tailoring companies and individual artisans um, can take? What, what, what steps can they take in order to I wouldn't say promote the 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 culture of dressing for the season or having dress codes, but making tailoring more relevant from any aspect possible. What sort of steps do you think would help with that? Um, I think fundamentally for some of the sort of, well, from the older houses, looking at several in particular, you know, there's often the preconception that they only make old fashioned things. I mean, the very nature of bespoke is that your garments and cloth are bespoken for. You pick mm-hmm. what you want. Your tailor will make it. You know, you, you as tailors and individuals, for either from a company or a freelance perspective, you know, somebody that comes to you to to be dressed and they trust your expertise and knowledge and and relevance to to dress them to go to certain events. I mean, some of the high high profile customers that we deal with, we dress and advise best to dress for occasions or for particular events. But, you know, I think to sort of break down that that barrier between, you know, tailors only making suits. I mean, there's so many different levels within bespoke tailoring and indeed bespoke shirt making. You don't have to just have a white button, uh, you know, double cuff shirt, for example. There's so many different, different things that you can have. And it's ultimately when you get people, particularly people who are new to the bespoke process and you explain to them you know you you can literally have whatever you want and when people then get excited and then start to build wardrobes initially it's how you you know perhaps look at maybe having something like this but ultimately it is completely up to you you know when people then get excited about really pushing the boundaries of having you know outfits made and shirts to go with matching shorts and you know different trousers for holiday and all of that different things you know it's creating that excitement around clothing because I think it's quite often damaged by sort of more high street trends that people sort of become quite, you know, uh, I don't want to say close minded, but they, they sort of see what's available and don't really think past being able to just go in somewhere and buy something, which sadly quite often gets thrown away or, or given, to, you know, to, to landfill. But, you know, until people get behind that bespoke process and, and truly understand that you can have whatever you want, you know, that's when it will really pick up and be more relevant ultimately because it isn't just old chalk stripe suits, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you do you think that uh, bespoke in any form, not just bespoke suits, but bespoke shirts, bespoke shorts, uh, any, anything, literally anything, do you think it can ever um, be cheap? as cheap as the high street brands but then still be able to to kind of like you know maybe provide every look if i when i was like 13 14 15 right um first of all i didn't know anything about bespoke and secondly 
I was looking for clothing that I had some sort of an image in my mind of how I wanted it to fit, uh, but I couldn't find it, right? So I had this problem. Also, I, you know, I, I didn't have a, any money to, to, to buy anything proper. So um, let's say for, for a younger um, demographic who, who kind of like cannot afford anything expensive, even if they would work like 24 seven at McDonald's or whatsoever, um, how do you think there could ever be an introduction to to buying bespoke clothing? Uh, you know, they're, they're what, speaking from a, a, a several perspective, obviously we're, we're working in, in the very the, the highest level of, of garment construction in the world. But, you know, that's not to say that other people can't achieve a certain aesthetic in the way that they address and present themselves. Mm -hmm. By buying key pieces, what's to stop somebody buying something and taking it to a local alteration tailor to, mm -hmm. you know, fit them better than it did if they bought it off the peg, for example? There's there's nothing stopping mm -hmm. people from sort of, you know, loosely entering that sort of more bespoke path, if you like, where things are more unique mm -hmm. and tailored to that individual to meet their mm -hmm. sort of price bracket. You know, there, there's we often suggest to people that who come in and and. Are, you know, looking for a more ready to wear type thing, but you know, you buy things and, and start thinking about how you're going to wear those garments and ultimately get the most use out of them. Be, be more excited about one's wardrobe and, and strive to, you know, create looks if, as it were, rather than, you know, every day's not a catwalk for goodness sake, but you know, if people truly are interested in clothing and, and love to present themselves in a certain way, perhaps several of them are, it, it being caught at the, the very highest end of, of, garment creation that obviously the price then lends itself to that but you know there's nothing to stop people from amassing a fine wardrobe of various pieces that are unique or have been made unique through alteration or adaptation mm -hmm. to suit your budget yeah yeah this is a great point i mean uh, one of the things that many people don't realize is uh, you know you can alter things to to fit you and actually make them look nice somehow it seems that the alteration part of, of bespoke or tailoring in general hasn't put, at least not that I know, hasn't made any efforts to, to present, to make itself, uh, I don't want to use the word sexy, but uh, it, it hasn't done any effort to make itself like, you know, you're a cool guy if you go to an alteration tailor. You're much cooler if you go to a bespoke tailor, right? Well, ultimately, yes, that, that does, that point does still stand, but, you know, when one has something, you're not talking about, you know, yes, you could, if you buy a jacket, for example, the, at the absolute minimum, make sure your sleeve length sorted out. You know, if, if it means that you want it take slightly on the waist to get a bit more suppression and, and show a bit of daylight under your arms, then fair enough. But, you know, what's to stop you from buying something and thinking, God, that's really nice, but I'm not really, I don't really like those buttons. If you change the buttons on something, it can completely transform the look of the whole garment even if it's a blouse or, or anything, just to, you know, make it more unique. That you, there's, there's so much scope with just applying a, a small bit of personal incentive into, into what you're doing that can completely transform something and then make it different to everybody else's. I think it's just, you know, with, with regards to the alteration side of things, that there's, you know, often there are things which aren't, it's not a complete overhaul of the whole garment. It's just a few key adaptations and well, ultimately alterations that are made which can just completely transform something but people often overlook that opportunity to do that you know people just wouldn't necessarily think to even have that done yes yes i i, I think it's it's a big gap I, I i think it would be there are so many opportunities in alterations the thing is also most alt the whole at least to me and i think most tailors that i've spoken to except for alteration tailors the concept of alterations to someone who is, let's say, a coat maker, trouser maker, or whatsoever, it makes them some, some, it just stiffens them up because they're thinking like, I've spent like just a hundred hours making this and now I need to take it apart. I would, you know? Oh, absolutely. And that, that is, you know, that I, from personal experience, I, I, I do agree with them, but it's, you know, if you spend so long making something and you invest, you know, up until that very stitch that you've just done that, in effect is your life's work has led to that one stitch hasn't it all of your experience has been concentrated into, into what you're doing at present on the board and yeah i do understand that from a, a making perspective there is a slight apprehension regarding something being taken apart etc but 
you know, ultimately, you want something to, to be the best it can be. And if that means that it needs tweaking here and there, for example, that has to just be embraced as part of the, of the process and ultimately only really lends itself to the nature of bespoke because it's being altered to fit an individual. Yes, yes. Now, there's one thing I... Uh... I don't know if I heard you correctly, but even if I didn't, it, it's it's okay. Did you in the very beginning of the interview say that um, craftsmen tend to live forever? Uh, no, not not quite live forever. I mean, it might seem that way if you do spend some time in a number of workshops. But um, no, people people have their craft, and and they, from my experience and my sort of observation in the trade, people tend to. You know keep just keep going because it as much as it is what with what we do at, as bespoke tailors you know if you didn't absolutely love it it's as much a hobby as it is a profession you know i'll finish at work i'm very fortunate that i have a, a sort of a workshop facility if you like i've got a board and stuff at home and the machine and that that i can can work from that it might be the case that i get in of an evening and i think do you know what i might quickly uh you know put my out breast well in you know, I've always got something on the go for myself. If you really, truly love garments and creating them and wearing what you've made and, and the whole nature of it, you know, it, it will go on forever with you because there'll come a point where, you know, I've known tailors who have retired in their late 60s in, in, in the basement room in well, at Demon and Goddard. A, a gentleman retired, or two actually, in varying ages, but both got to that age of retirement. And uh, within a year or two, both came back to working they obviously they, there's obviously a difference when you spent some time retired and then you then come back to working they might have been slightly slower you know they came back it was more on their terms than the cutters terms for example whereby they said you know i'm going to come back I, I might make a jacket a week you know one every two weeks whatever but they're coming back rather than getting there i mean as you you'll know yourself tailors often get to work at the crack of dawn and stay well past your seven eight o'clock in the evenings um but these gentlemen would come in slightly later, they'd stop, have a bit of lunch communally again, like sort of a, a shared lunch, if you like, sort of platters of food, etc. You know, they'd make it more of a social and then they'd be continuing their hobby. I mean, they're still working now. One of the gentlemen's in his mid 80s and he's still absolutely happy to keep going because it's not going to work. I know it sounds sort of, I don't want to say it again too cliche, but to say, you know, love what you do and, and it's not like going to work but that very much is the case for a lot of people in our trade that they really do absolutely love it and it's as much a hobby as it is a profession yeah it might yes. <laughs> no it's, it's it's completely true um okay uh, so i i have i have a speed round which is uh, a, a series of words um and i'll and i'll just Give them to you one by one and you you tell me the first thing that pops over your mind okay and then we'll wrap it up um packaging precision trust sorry did you say trust 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 yes i would say master as in my master you have to trust in your master as you there and you are their apprentice uh, repetition skill apprenticeships worth it <laughs> the golden shears excellent that's the word I'd use for that <laughs> tradition upheld Revolution. Embraced. <laughs> Late nights. I completed it. Regular is another way to. Co yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't um, think you've truly. Competition. Um, how would I answer competition? Uh, differing style I'd say to that as you know with, with all of our houses everybody has their own house style and, and ultimately yes they are a competition but we're all 
together as several row tailors. So that's an interesting one. That's true. Um, city tailors. I would suggest, blimey, you've really thrown that at me there. I don't really know too much about city tailoring to answer that, but I would suggest that it may be slightly different to a certain extent, but that's not to speak ill of any any work that goes on outside of the West End. Dress codes. Um, inspiration. I'd put dress codes down as you can be inspired by one's dress code. I mean, I wear a fresh carnation every day. There's a nod to, you know, you look back to the 40s and 50s, gentlemen would have worn a, a black jacket with a bowler hat and cashmere striped trousers with their cane umbrella on their arm. I wear a carnation as a nod to tradition, but I also pick out which colour carnation I'd like to wear, which best complements my handkerchief and what particular suit I'm wearing that day. So I like to, you know, mm -hmm embrace that sort of tradition but it's not trying to reinvent the wheel but it's just a, a a more appropriate modern outlook on it makes sense um alterations sometimes necessary <laughs> tedious is the word i'd um, say if you have to do it <laughs> um okay and last but not least savile row God, I'm going to get a lot of stick for saying it, but I would ultimately say home. It is home to what we do. It's, you know, it it starts and ends with that sort of thing. You know, it all varying sort of manifestations of fashion quite often lend themselves back to the old school and being inspired by a particular way and adapting that method and pushing the boundaries forward to create something new and interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, Joe, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure talking to you. I think there are many topics that uh, we haven't covered, but uh, that's probably something for the future. Um, thank you for being here and uh, until next time. Welcome. Thank you for having me. So, and that was Joe. I hope you all enjoyed the conversation. If you'd like to see more from Joe, you can follow the link to his Instagram in the description of this video. If you have any thoughts, comments or questions, please let us know. And I hope to see you again in the next episode. Until then, bye-bye.